Good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our third lecture in the Brands Mars series. And it's a great pleasure to introduce and have Father Leopold uh, do this lecture for us today. And his title is That Dangerous Little Friar Strikes Back. Without any further ado, I'm going to ask our prior from Whitefriars Hall, Father Nepi, to lead us in prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of peace and justice, you open our hearts to love and to the joy of the gospel, even in the midst of countless forms of violence that take away the dignity of our brothers and sisters. Fill us with your grace so that like St. Titus Bransma, we may in tenderness see beyond the horrors of inhumanity and contemplate your glory that shines forth through the martyrs of every age and so become your authentic witnesses in the world today. Amen. Amen. Our Lady of Mount Carmel, pray, pray for us. us. St. Titus Bransma, pray, pray for us. us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. And our chair of the Center for Carmelite Studies will introduce our speaker, Father Leopold. Thank you, Brother Darrell. I've known Father Leopold for many years. He's uh, often helped us with our uh, Carmelite history projects and himself has, uh, has taught many of the Carmelite history courses um, that uh, I, I followed in his footsteps of doing Carmelite history. He's uh, a member of the province of the most pure heart of Mary based in Darien, Illinois, a noted Carmelite historian, Father Glukert received his PhD from Loyola University of Chicago, and among his many positions in secondary and university level education, he's taught history at DePaul, Loyola University in Chicago, and eight years at Lewis University. Here in the Washington area, he taught ecclesiastical history and courses on Carmelite spirituality at the Washington Theological Union from 2005 until the union closed in 2012. He's the author of uh, the book we use in, in our Carmelite history courses here, Desert Springs in the City, A Concise History of the Carmelites, which was published in 2012. Uh, he's also written books and articles on Teresa Lisieux, on Titus Bransma. I have this little booklet, Titus Bransma, Friar Against Fascism, which he, which he wrote, and other topics of interest in the Carmelite community. He's been president of the Carmelite Institute. He's a member of the American Historical Association and the American Catholic Historical Association. And so we're very honored today to have Father Leopold Glucker to talk to us about Titus Bransma, the dangerous little friar. Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon. I'm uh, happy that uh, those of you who are here present and also uh, following uh, 
on the recording are uh, interested in Titus Bransma and his life and work. He was certainly a, a unique contributor to the, the good part of the 20th century. The uh, title here, Dangerous Little Friar Strikes Back, is, uh, it sounds a little strange uh, for such a peaceful person, but Titus was one of those who, as a philosopher, was in a position to understand Nazi propaganda and their version of fake news much better than many others. So uh, with that in mind, um, try to remember that uh, he was a philosopher above all things. As I look at his life, there were three different episodes that I can identify that uh, showed what kind of person he was <coughs> and uh, gave us a great deal to uh, remember, respond to, and reflect on. Uh, these periods were the pre-war time when he was a professor at the University of Nijmegen uh, with the uh, uh, subsequent occupation of the Netherlands by the German army. The second episode was uh, after his arrest and uh, his interrogation at the prison in Scheveningen. And then the third would be his transfer to Dachau prison camp and uh, his death there. Uh, sadly, our time constraints mean that uh, I'm only going to address the first two of these, uh, likely because they're uh, a bit lesser known than his time in Dachau. In the, uh, the case of the uh, uh, sorry, I can't get the slide to change. That's it, good, thank you. Isn't technology wonderful? The um, basics of Titus's life, I think are uh, reasonably well known to many of you who've done a little homework. Uh, he was uh, above all a, uh, a Frisian and a uh, uh, person who grew up in a very simple existence, but uh, one that nourished his own piety and reflectiveness. He uh, was interested in many things, and uh, especially during the 1930s, when he was uh, a university professor, he spoke frequently about the new paganism of Nazi Germany, and its lectures and uh, writings were already well known to the Nazi authorities in Germany. Uh, he was, above all, a patriot, and uh, a person who understood the, uh, the Catholic Church as truly a, a universal family. During the uh, time that he was uh, an intellectual and a professor, many things were unfolding in the wider world. Um, I'm zooming in on 1917, the time of the Russian Revolution, when Titus was already a teacher he was 36 years old. He was teaching philosophy to Carmelite clerics at Aus. He had founded a uh, uh, spiritual publication called Carmel Rosen. And uh, he had uh, already thrown himself into scholarship on uh, the works of Teresa of Avila. He was translating many of the uh, Carmelite classics into good modern Dutch. Now, the communist revolution in Russia is going to send shockwaves through all of Europe. There was a sense of uh, panic, uh, especially when Lenin began nationalizing banks and businesses, uh, sources of production, as well as uh, farms and uh, any kind of uh, piled up wealth. Anyone who had even the slightest amount of 
money in the bank or real estate, uh, was seized with a panic that it, could a, a similar thing happen in, in our area. There were attempts, all of them failures, in the city of Berlin, state of Bavaria, the country of Hungary, to set up communist regimes but all of these failed uh, largely through uh, the violence of people who were uh, opposed to Marxism. This uh, led to uh, a backlash of uh, political flavor, let's call it, uh, which began to uh, uh, suspend uh, protection for civil rights and uh, other protections of law in the wildest possibility that uh, any of this uh, might uh, turn into a Marxist state wherever other people in Europe lived. Um, there were three very strong anti-communist regimes that came to power. Mussolini's fascists in Italy in 1922, Hitler and the Nazis in Germany, 1933, and then finally Franco and the Falangists in Spain in 1939. You might find it interesting that uh, there were fascist movements in other countries as well, uh, strong right-wing regimes that uh, were uh, actually looking for opportunities to come to blows with uh, union leaders, Marxists, socialists of, of any sort and uh, uh, fight them in the streets, burn their headquarters, crack their heads. Um, the other countries, including, believe it or not, Britain and Ireland, uh, were several, but uh, of course, these never came to power. In Titus's own Netherlands, there was a party called the NSB, which was uh, largely ridiculed by most Dutchmen because of its uh, ineptness. But uh, when the, the uh, Nazi invasion took place, uh, the NSB was suddenly put into power in the Netherlands, which of course is going to uh, have a lot to do with Titus. Uh, at the bottom of this frame, you see the NSB shield, uh, which uh, <coughs> followed the, uh, the pattern of, of uh, the fascists and the Nazis uh, in uh, the leading fascist countries. Uh, you see these uh, characteristics of a fascist movement. Uh, above all, there was a, uh, uh, a, an absolute need to control the sources of communication. The, uh, the fascist parties, like the Marxist parties, didn't want any dissenting uh, voices in their uh, broadcast of information uh, to the people of the country. They all wanted to speak with one voice and anyone who got in the way uh, could be in danger. Now, uh, during the 1940s, <clears throat> Titus uh, spoke of the uh, new paganism of uh, Nazi Germany. He, uh, remember, was a philosopher and he was acutely aware of the ideas and propaganda that was beginning to flood through Europe. The Nazi party pro uh, promoted a very broad spectrum of uh, basic principles which enshrined the raw power and violence of the party, especially at the expense of the weak. Uh, since Titus was a philosopher, he immediately connected uh, this pathology with Friedrich Nietzsche's celebration of the Superman uh, which glorified the violent exploitation of others as the only path to survival and uh, success. In other words, the only way to rise uh, at the top of the heap in your society is by stepping on everybody below you. Uh, those were inferior people. They were not given respect. And uh, as uh, such a mindset for Nietzsche and those who followed him. Christianity was ridiculed for its care and attention to the poor, the sick, the elderly, the handicapped, all of whom would eventually become a target of Hitler's violence. In uh, Bransma's own Netherlands, 
The NSB reflected the same toxic views, although in a considerably milder form until the war broke out. During this period, uh, Titus was uh, very busy at the university. He uh, worked for uh, many worthy causes in addition to his university duties. Uh, he worked for the reconciliation of the Eastern churches, organized a Marian Congress, organized another Congress on Dutch medieval mysticism. He uh, contributed to the activities honoring St. Boniface and many of the Frisian saints. He went on a lecture tour of Ireland, Canada, and the United States in 1935, and his lectures were eventually published in uh, a title called Carmelite Mysticism, Historical Sketches. You may have uh, been aware of this book, which has been uh, just republished recently. Now, in July 16th of 1939, uh, Titus delivered a sermon honoring Saints Boniface and Willebrook. He pointed out that the old Germanic paganism uh, was based on powerful forces of nature, but uh, this belief was not nearly as dangerous as the neo-paganism of the Nazis. Um, pretending that smashing one's enemies was a form of high civilization had nothing to do, said Titus, with authentic Nordic culture or the centuries of uh, Christian tradition and spirituality. The value of the, uh, the human person was paramount in the eyes of God. Uh, in this way, Titus in uh, practice and in word uh, followed the uh, the dictum that says, uh, see how these Christians love one another. Now, in each step of his truth telling, Titus was recorded by meticulous agents of Hitler's SS, this uh, through the so-called security service, the SD or Sicherheitsdienst. And even before the outbreak of the war or the invasion of the Netherlands, Titus was already well known to agents uh, of the SD in Berlin who added uh, their reports to a thickening dossier of Titus Bransma's activity. Titus told his friends that there were two young men who attended his lectures at the university but were not registered as students. They took detailed notes on whatever he said but never asked questions or took exams. So these were not legitimate students, most likely just Nazi spies. Overall, Titus was uh, highly respected by his colleagues. Uh, here you see him uh, wearing the uh, insignia of the rector of the university. This was a uh, honorary one-year appointment, uh, which Titus uh, filled uh, shortly after Hitler came to power in Germany. Now, at the time that uh, World War II began, uh, Hitler invaded Poland in September of 1939. The uh, tragedy of this period was that Britain and France both responded and declared war, but did not attack the German Western Front. The uh, Poles were pretty much left on their own, and they were the first nation to face the, uh, the Blitzkrieg, which involved fast moving columns of tanks, bombing from the air, and then paratroops to drop ahead of the columns to seize bridges, and make sure that they were not stopped by natural barriers like rivers and canals. That's exactly what happened in the Netherlands. You see from this map that you have uh, Nazi columns uh, converging on the British and French troops uh, in the uh, lower left-hand corner. 
but there was one panzer division out of 10 that was designated for the occupation of the Netherlands. And the, uh, the paratroopers more or less took care of making it easy for those tanks and vehicles to occupy the whole country. The Dutch army fought very bravely, but they were defeated in six days. So this puts the NSB in charge of the uh, administration of the government, the civil government in the Netherlands. And uh, it slowly uh, modeled the details of Dutch life to reflect Nazi ideology. The uh, points of conflict uh, between Titus and the occupation forces became uh, a bit more clear with each passing day. Uh, the NSB worked to tighten their hold on the ordinary life of Holland, and Titus uh, had plans to uh, counter uh, their policies by doing things like protecting Jewish students in their schools, maintaining the freedom of Catholic schools, and to strengthen the Catholic press, which uh, at this time was uh, surprisingly strong and popular in the Netherlands. There were many Catholic newspapers and journals uh, some daily newspapers that uh, had a rather wide readership. It was uh, his tireless work on behalf of the bishops that uh, finally got Titus into direct conflict with the Nazis. His uh, ironclad refusal to allow fake news or advertisements from the Nazi press office to contaminate the integrity of Catholic newspapers this marked the point of no return. His uh, fate had already been decided in Berlin and uh, they knew quite well that Titus was too intelligent and methodical to be convinced to accept propaganda. He was too courageous and stubborn to be frightened or swayed by threats and intimidation. So nothing remained to the authorities except his arrest an ultimate death, and so it was. When Titus was finally arrested by the Gestapo on January 19th, 1942, he was locked in a solitary cell. Like many other Dutch patriots, he was taken to a prison uh, close to the beach at uh, The Hague called the Orange Hotel, uh, sort of a nickname. Uh, this was the prison at Scheveningen. What you see here is a uh, rather attractive looking beach photo taken about uh, 1900. But uh, the building in the background is the Scheveningen prison. Now, many of the uh, people held here were patriots uh, and the, uh, the prison picked up the nickname Orange Hotel as a result of the connection with the Royal House of Orange and the Queen's government in exile. Many of uh, Titus's fellow pris prisoners may very well have sunk into despair that their normal lives were at an end. But for Titus, it was really just the beginning. Uh, Friar Bransma had lived his entire life in total faithfulness to the Carmelite rule. One essential element of that rule states that the individuals should stay in his own cell or near it, pondering the Lord's law day and night and keeping watch at his prayers, unless attending to some other duty. Well, this was uh, something that Titus knew that he was committed to. Uh, those other duties, as you uh, can appreciate, had kept him very busy for a long time. And yet here he is now in prison. He can't go out. There's no meeting to rush off to. There's nothing that he has to do as far as uh, the ministry that was keeping him so busy uh, because of all those uh, other duties that were so dazzling when he was a free man. At the request of the Dutch bishops, he was also the spiritual uh, liaison for the Catholic schools and the delegate uh, for the Catholic journalists. And suddenly all that activity came to a stop. 
In the seven weeks that Titus spent at Scheveningen, he uh, was in a prison that was uh, relatively easy as prisons go. Um, this is what it looked like at the time of the war. And uh, it was actually a normal civilian facility that had been taken over by the SS. And uh, it was home to Titus during his interrogation by SS Sergeant Major uh, Paul Hardigan. The um, interrogation at Scheveningen was perhaps the best illustration of the conflict of values which uh, sent Titus to his death in, uh, in Dachau. Uh, you'll find that it was uh, surprisingly a, uh, a, a fairly uh, easy place to live. It, it was a stark existence as all prisons are, but it wasn't actively cruel like the concentration camps would later be. Titus was allowed to wear his own clothes, he was allowed to uh, have books, tobacco, writing materials. The materials, uh, the, sorry, the meals were simple, but uh, fairly healthy. And uh, there was plenty of food, at least at first. And uh, in fact, it seemed to be such an ordinary prison that uh, Titus never quite let go of the idea that he might be released at any time. And so it was that uh, Titus immediately um, went to uh, the encounter with Hardigan and the, uh, the interviews that uh, uh, turn out to, to tell us a great deal about Titus and uh, what he was as a person. Um, I think that Hardigan secretly liked Titus because uh, they got along rather well. They, they were both friendly and uh, uh, very polite, very businesslike. Uh, they were like two scholars discussing uh, theories of, uh, uh, of, of anything. Uh, and yet uh, Hardigan's job, he knew, was to uh, make sure that Titus incriminated himself and uh, was not... Uh, uh, any longer a threat to the Third Reich. He uh, concluded that Titus would never abandon his convictions. Uh, that was actually the sort of uh, thing that was the source for the respect that Hardigan had for him. But uh, since Titus was going to be uh, the target of these investigations, uh, there was really going to be no place to run. Specifically, Hardigan asked Titus why uh, the Dutch people, and especially the Catholics, uh, had no, no good word to say about the NSB. Well, the result was that uh, Titus was given paper and writing materials and uh, told to uh, put his ideas on paper. Well, the NSB uh, quite frankly, uh, were a bunch of buffoons who uh, like to put out a, a very brave uh, facade and yet uh, had very little competence in running the government of the state that they were now tasked to follow uh, by the Nazi authorities. Uh, Titus wrote a multi-page essay uh, on the NSB and the whole context of the Nazi ethos. He was able to cite uh, several different uh, sources from memory, uh, quoting this or that or another uh, author, including some Nazi authors. And his three conclusions, which uh, went back to Hardigan, were first of all, that the NSB is anti-national. They uh, among other things, uh, uh, they were just bad Dutchmen, although they were pretending to be uh, the, the saviors of Dutch civilization. Number two point was that their leaders are arrogant and incompetent. They, uh, they really had no skills for running a government or much of anything else. And since the invasion, point number three, uh, was their collaboration with the German occupiers. 
they, uh, they, they simply picked up uh, and parroted much of the German propaganda, uh, even when they didn't even understand it. Uh, Titus pointed out that they ignored many of the, uh, the really good spiritual qualities of Dutch culture. They simply waved aside all of the things the Dutch had accomplished over the centuries. And uh, their use of German ideas, including even bad translations from the German, were just childish and bungling in such a way that uh, the, the ordinary Dutch citizen had no reason to put any faith or respect in the NSB. Well, uh, this is obviously a posed picture here, but uh, Titus in his encounters with, uh, with Hardigan um, came back and forth a couple of times with uh, uh, different interviews. Uh, it wasn't just one meeting, it was several. And uh, as the uh, interesting part of this interview went, uh, Hardigan uh, simply uh, concluded that uh, sadly, Bransma was not about to change his mind on anything. Um, Titus continued to point out in detail how uh, lacking the Nazi fascist movement was in actually helping real people with their lives. Uh, he insisted that uh, Dutch culture was enriched by religion, especially uh, the Dutch mysticism of the Middle Ages. Titus was an expert on that, remember. And uh, denying spiritual values was uh, simply a blind alley. Uh, he pointed out in his essay that uh, what appeared to be renewal and revival of the German culture uh, under the Nazis uh, lacked a spiritual basis, and it was basically hollow. And uh, even uh, comparing the two countries with one another, uh, the Dutch people lived better than the Germans. Uh, uh, until the, uh, the war destroyed the economies and the societies of both. Of course, Titus did not live to see that. And uh, he uh, never stopped pointing out that suppressing the influence of the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches is an insult to God and the Dutch heritage. A conclusion of that essay, which I love, Titus says, God bless the Netherlands. God bless Germany. God grant us that both people will soon stand side by side in full peace and freedom, recognizing God and honoring him for the well-being and flourishing of both so closely related people. In other words, we're seeing hate the sin, love the sinner. He uh, always respected and got along well with the Germans, uh, regardless of uh, the, the mistakes or the, uh, the violent activities that they could sometimes generate. And so, during this period in Scheveningen, Titus uh, went to work immediately, turning his prison cell into a monastic cell. All of this uh, busy, frantic activity at the service of the church and state had come to a sudden end. And uh, there was really nothing that he had to hurry off to do. There was nowhere to go. So with uh, his uh, traditional optimism, Titus decided that although he was stuck in a cell, he was perhaps going to have the time of his life here. He decided to embrace the more spiritual side of Carmelite life with greater enthusiasm, if only to maybe catch up with the prayerful reflection that he had been too busy for in his previous life. I think this is one of the, the, the most outstanding examples of uh, the holiness and the spirituality of uh, this Dutch Carmelite. Uh, to begin with, he set up a simple prayer altar in his cell using holy cards from his breviary. He displayed cards of the Sacred Heart, 
St. Teresa, St. John of the Cross. He opened his breviary to a beautiful picture of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. He uh, made it a point to remain conscious according to what time it was of the day or night of what his brother Carmelites were doing at their house in Nijmegen at any hour. And he tried to match his activity with theirs. So he uh, set up a, a, a timetable for himself of both uh, liturgical and devotional prayers uh, with his community. The uh, times of eating and sleeping were beyond his control. They were controlled by the uh, prison authorities, but he managed to schedule around them for regular times for prayer, meditating, exercise, study and writing, relaxing, and tidying up his cell. He even worked, believe it or not, on composing from memory a biography of Teresa of Avila. When he ran out of paper, he uh, took a book that he was no longer reading, turned it upside down, and continued writing in the white space between the lines of print. So uh, he, was, he was busy without being busy. He uh, more or less uh, fell back on a, uh, a kind of hermit's existence. Uh, I call this a tale of two cells, which uh, uh, is, I think, very clear to you. Uh, and he simply uh, made his existence in this uh, very boring cell into a, a kind of a retreat uh, for whatever was going to follow. It's interesting that uh, he was able to, uh, to write uh, one of his uh, uh, occasional letters, which he was allowed to produce. Uh, he wrote, Blessed Solitude, I am already quite at home in this small cell. I have not yet got bored here, quite the contrary. I am alone, certainly, but never was our Lord so close to me. I could shout for joy because he made me find him again entirely, without me going to see people, nor people me. Now he is my only refuge, and I feel secure and happy. I would stay here forever if he so disposed. Seldom have I been so happy or content. Now, of course, in his next prisons, uh, the circumstances would not be so pleasant. But uh, his days at Scheveningen may have been God's blessing <coughs> as a spiritual preparation for what came next. Now, if you've been reading carefully about Titus, you know that he was transferred to uh, several other uh, prisons or camps uh, after this, uh, was transferred to a, a, another Dutch holding prison at Amersfoort, uh, for about an equal time uh, that he was uh, in Scheveningen. And then Clave in Germany, which was a transit camp, and then finally Dachau in uh, June of 1942. Uh, he used all of this time wherever he could to minister to other prisons in clergy blocks, uh, notably Block 26 in uh, Dachau. And uh, fortunately for him, there was another Dutch Carmelite, Brother Raphael Taihus, uh, who uh, was there to help him uh, at the, uh, the end of his life. Uh, he finally died uh, of weakness and illness, uh, July 27th, 1942. Um, Brother Raphael was a, a friend of mine. He survived the camp and uh, was living in Rome when I was there for theology. And uh, he was uh, uh, always considering himself very blessed that he had been there uh, to, to know Titus and help him to whatever degree they could. Uh, just uh, as a point of interest, he spent seven weeks in Scheveningen, an equal time at Amersfoort, three weeks uh, at Clave, uh, during which there was a, 
uh, an active possibility of transferring him from the prisons to uh, one of the German Carmelite houses where he could live under uh, what might be called the uh, house arrest. Uh, but that uh, fell through and never went any place until he was finally transferred to Dachau. Now, um, you know that uh, none of these prisons were uh, very pleasant places to be. All of them were based on uh, brutality and uh, Nietzsche's uh, concept of uh, the, the strong exploiting the weak for their own purposes. And uh, each one of these, uh, these venues got uh, progressively worse for a person whose health had never been very uh, uh, good to begin with. Even as a boy, he was uh, sickly and weak and uh, always seemed to be uh, coming down with some different sort of fever. So for someone who was already frail, uh, this kind of treatment was uh, going to be uh, uh, fairly terrible. Um, you'll find it interesting that the Dachau concentration camp was the main holding prison for Catholic clergy. No matter where they lived in Germany or elsewhere, if uh, they were arrested, eventually they were sent to Dachau. 90% of the uh, 2,720 clergy uh, who went to Dachau were Catholics. There were three different barracks for the clergy in Dachau, 26, 28, and 30. Uh, it was barracks 26 that was the international one, which included uh, Dutch prisoners like Raphael and Titus. And uh, they were allowed to have a small chapel, which was uh, a source of great consolation. Um, Block 28 was reserved for Polish clergy, uh, like the uh, uh, several Polish Carmelites who were there, including Hilary Januszewski. And uh, block number 30 was for the German clergy. Uh, fortunately, the, uh, the Germans got a few privileges from uh, their, their captors. Uh, they were allowed to have a, uh, a chapel of their own and uh, to celebrate mass occasionally, which uh, actually also turned out to be the source of the Holy Eucharist that uh, Titus was uh, sometimes able to uh, secrete in a, an eyeglass case and uh, take to uh, his own block and uh, use that as the central point of uh, prayer services and uh, whatever worship they were able to uh, enact. Um, you'll find it, uh, I think, especially poignant that uh, Titus considered uh, Dachau to be uh, his, his final ministry. And uh, rather than simply rolling over and dying in despair, like so many of those uh, unfortunates did, Titus used his, uh, his last days to uh, move around the camp to whatever areas he could reach and uh, tried to encourage his, uh, uh, his friends and his fellow prisoners. Um, it was uh, strictly pro prohibited to talk to the guards, of course, but uh, wouldn't you know it, Titus talked to the guards. He was always reaching out, trying to find some spark of humanity in these uh, extremely brutal men and uh, tried to uh, uh, bring out whatever good may have been in them. Uh, on one occasion, uh, after so many guards just beat him senseless for his attempts to, to talk to them, there was one guard who called to him across the yard and ordered him, come here immediately. And uh, the guard grabbed him by the shoulder, dragged him around the corner of the building and said, I haven't been to confession in two years. You've got to help me. Uh, Titus also uh, encouraged his fellow prisoners to uh, include even the concentration camp guards in their prayer. And uh, when there were so many people uh, that, that were, were starting to shout, no, not them, we, we can't pray for those 
uh, those animals, uh, Titus just shrugged and said, well, you don't have to pray for them all day. It was uh, just trying to uh, uh, hold on for uh, what little might be possible. I'm sure most of you already know that uh, in his final uh, death, the nurse that gave Titus his final uh, injection of carbolic acid uh, was a fallen away Catholic. Uh, she uh, told him uh, quite clearly that uh, she didn't believe anymore. She was not a practicing Catholic, but Titus insisted that she take his rosary because he obviously was not going to have any more need of it. Well, she did that. And uh, years later, the same woman came back and was able to testify to uh, the holiness of Titus as part of the uh, investigation for his uh, beatification. She uh, did return to the practice of her faith. So at least in this one case, Titus uh, got through the, the armor of atheism. Uh, I'm sure there would have been others as well, but uh, we don't always know about them. This was a, um, a ghastly episode on the uh, uh, history of the human race. And uh, we are, I think, very smart to remember that uh, man's humanity to man takes many forms and it is by no means gone from our world. Uh, this is the, uh, the layout of one of the barracks blocks early in the war, but uh, later on, there were more and more people being arrested and packed into the camps so that the, the crowding was uh, really merciless. Uh, Titus did not live to see the, uh, the, the heavy crowding, but uh, Brother Raphael did. Toward the end of the war, there were so many prisoners in his block that uh, no one could actually stretch out uh, on the bunk to sleep during the night. They had to sleep sitting up uh, back to back, more or less like bookends. And uh, the, uh, the bunk mate for Raphael was a, a, Czech, Carmel, uh, sorry, a, a Czech diocesan priest named Josef Baran, who uh, eventually uh, was released with Raphael went back to uh, Prague and uh, eventually uh, became uh, Archbishop of Prague and Cardinal Baran, uh, who attended the uh, Second Vatican Council and made a very eloquent uh, plea for uh, freedom of uh, religious thought, toleration, uh, getting along with uh, even people that you are convinced are uh, totally wrong in preaching heresy. Uh, that had a great deal to do with the, uh, the, the flavor that many of the council documents took. So there we are. I think we have a few minutes left over if uh, someone might have a question or comment. Be courageous, Titus was. Okay. In that case, uh, I thank you for your attention. Uh, please let's continue to pray for one another and pray for peace where there is war and discrimination anywhere in our world. Thank you. God bless you. We want to thank Father Leopold for that wonderful talk. And uh, uh, now we've had three talks on Titus Bransma this semester uh, for the uh, sponsored by the Center for Carmelite Studies, all in preparation for his canonization uh, next month on May 15th. I know a number of people will be very interested in that. If you can't go to it, I'm sure it will be possible to watch it on, on, uh, uh, on TV. Uh, pre-recorded, I mean, recorded, and so on later too. If you haven't, if you're not able to see it live, and we're hoping in the fall uh, for our annual lecture on, on Carmelite studies 
to have something around uh, Titus Brands then as well. So this is a big year for Titus and we're, we're very happy to be a part of it. And we thank you all for participating and thanks to Brother Daryl for organizing this and for all of you who are here with us and all who are, who are watching, we're very grateful.